All right, let's uh, call to order today's House Judiciary Committee meeting. I appreciate y'all being here. Um, if you would, please bow your heads with me, and we'll begin this meeting with a uh, request for wisdom. Lord, we pause now, and we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the ability for all of us to participate uh, in this um, democratic form of government. We thank you for the blessings of serving in this legislature, and we ask you now as we do serve to give us the wisdom as we move forward, not only today, but with all the bills that we'll consider, not only here, but in other committees and on the floor. Thank you for this free country that we live in. Amen. All right. Senator Ligon, please come up, and uh, we'd love to hear from you on Senate Bill 37. Welcome. And uh, members of the committee, um, bring him before you, Senate Bill 37, and this is resp in response to a Court of Appeals decision in the, in the case of Crop Production Services uh, versus Moy. It was decided last March. And just a little background on that case. Um, in that case, a, a farmer had signed a, a guarantee for some loans for his children who were also going into farm, farming. And of course, at some point in time after a period of, of years, there was a default and um, the, the, the debtors on the loan couldn't pay. So the bank then in turn uh, looked um, to Mr. Moy, the guarantor, and uh, the issue in that case was whether or not a verbal agreement based on a conversation that they had uh, could terminate a guarantee. Mr. Moy claimed that, th that a conversation that he had with one of the, the, the lenders with their agent um, resulted in the cancellation of the contract. And the Court of Appeals held that an agreement uh, to cancel or terminate an agreement which is subject to the statute of frauds is a new agreement which is not subject to the statute of frauds. And so therefore you could, you could bring in, in evidence of an oral agreement to terminate a contract that is required to be in writing by the statute of frauds. Now this, um, of course, is reverberated through uh, the, the lending circles, but it also has you know, tremendous implications, I believe, in terms of, of the real estate practice because everyone is proceeding on the assumption that when you sign a contract to buy or sell a piece of land, that if you decide that you want to, to, to cancel that contract, that the cancellation must be in writing and must be agreed to. And the concern is that if this is not addressed by the legislature, that we will see a growth of litigation when there are allegations that a contract which is subject to the statute of frauds was canceled by verbal agreement. And so to address this, if you look on line 25, we're stating that any agreement to modify, alter, cancel, repeal, revoke, release, or rescind a promise, agreement, contract, or commitment provided for in subsection A of this code section, and that subsection A lists seven types of contracts that are subject to the statute of frauds, that, that that agreement to terminate must be in writing and signed by all parties to the agreement. Now, in our judiciary, in our committee, in the in banking committee, in the in the Senate, there was uh, a desire by some to say that if a party admits to canceling one of those agreements in a pleading, in testimony, or otherwise in court by their attorney standing up and making a stipulation, that obviously that is an admission that, that the guarantee or, or that contract had been terminated. And so we added that as, as part of an agreement uh, within our committee. To, to, to the bill. I don't think it, it hurts it. It certainly makes that clear. Um, and I think it may even actually state what the law would be uh, currently. So I'll be glad to answer any questions, um, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Senator. We appreciate that. And we do have some questions. Uh, Chairman Estration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator, for your presentation. I, um, know that we had a chance to discuss this in subcommittee and right. I've been thinking a lot about it since then 
And I very much agree. This is more of a comment, maybe. I very much agree with what you just said, which is that it really just makes it clear. So if there were to be a period after agreement in the bill, but then ultimately there were to be a dispute, say, where one of the parties stipulated that there was such an agreement or it was part of a pleading, then it's acknowledged and out there. What we're what we're really doing here is we're just saying that in the event that that were to come up, that that would be a recognized exception. That's and so right. it, it just makes it additionally clear. And, and so as I've thought further about it, I uh, certainly understand that reasoning. And, and, um, and although I had some questions before, I, I understand the, the language also, I don't believe you mentioned it, but the language is from the UCC. Is That's that right? right? It is. Okay. It is from the UCC. Yeah. Finance. All right. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> All right. Mr. Dreyer, is that you? Yes. Okay. Mr. Chair, thank you. Hi, Senator. Good afternoon. Yes, sir. Um, I'm trying to see if this is doing what I, what I think it's doing, but let me ask you if, if I'm right in thinking what this is going to do. The second part that you're referring to, what if a party admits that the contract was canceled in a pleading testimony or otherwise in court? Right. Then then that would be admissible and that would cancel the contract even if it was orally yes well the way i'm reading this it says however if the party against whom enforcement is sought admits the agreement was made right so if wouldn't that be so if i'm the the debtor in that case i'm the person against whom enforcement is sought right well no in in a contract for example a a real estate contract you have a buyer and and a seller and both are obligors one is obligated to sell and one is obligated to buy and you the 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 party against whom enforcement is sought is i guess the one who is allegedly in breach that's not supposed to be that's not doing what they're supposed to be doing and so you're seeking to enforce the contract against them it would be the same thing in in a guarantee situation in that guarantee the guarantor is obligated to do some things. The, the, the beneficiary of that, of that guarantee would have some obligations under that contract as well, such as to release the guarantee upon the occurrence of certain things. And so um, they could be the person against whom, or the entity, or the, or the party against whom enforcement is sought. Um, I, I think that the party against whom enforcement is sought can shift between the the, the two parties to the contract. Okay, and, and I definitely uh, agree with that policy. If if someone admits in testimony, deposition, some other way that, yeah, I agreed to cancel that contract if they made a 25% payment down to the principal or something like that, because I knew that's all I could get. Right. And, and, and I'm hearing you um, that it could be either way, but I would, I would be concerned, well, if I guess it could shift in a in the in a court case like it could is that what you're saying so like if i plead as an affirmative defense that there was a subsequent oral contract to cancel it but i don't know that a judge would read it that way i mean i would see see myself as a debtor as being the person against whom enforcement is sought and then i wouldn't have an opportunity to show that there was a subsequent agreement to cancel it right Right. I, I, I mean, I, I see what you're saying. Um, I think it requires you to, under, to, to decide what you mean about, by the party against whom enforcement is sought. And I think that could be either the one party or the other in a contract. And it just depends on what is the subject matter of the suit, who is suing who, who is seeking enforcement of a certain provision of a contract. It could be that the guarantor is seeking in enforcement of the contract, or it could be that the holder of the guarantee is is seeking enforcement. I mean, it, it right. can shift back and forth. So, so I don't I don't know, Mr. Chair, if anybody else in the committee shares that concern. But if but if it was if I was as a debtor, and I'm being sued in court, and there really was I I whatever I begged, borrowed, and stealed and paid down 50 percent of the principal, and there was an oral agreement to let me off the hook. And then I'm being sued. Um, th- then I'm the one whom enforcement against is sought. Then I can't offer 
any evidence of that oral cancellation because it only limits it to the person against whom enforcement sought. And if I'm the debtor, I'm being sued. I'm just, I'm just curious if anybody else sees that. We had an oral agreement that it was 50. At 50, you were letting me off. Well, you see, now, now you're seeking to enforce that oral agreement against me. And if I admit that there was an agreement in, in judicio, all this bill says is that it's in. I, I agree with that. I, I guess just the way it's worded, I'm concerned a court on a, on a counterclaim mm -hmm. might read it a little more narrowly. I don't know how else you would write it because then because it, it, I, I read it to, to apply it whenever you're seeking to admit that this, that this other agreement because this is only pertaining to a secondary agreement not the original right, first no, agreement. that's right so it really is applying to exactly the situation you're talking about and it's applying in the context of where someone is trying to say wait a minute I had an amendment we had a deviation from the original agreement right we had a cancellation and I need you to honor that, and you won't honor it. And now and it was oral, it was verbal. It, you know, it should have been in writing, is what we're saying. But if it's not, and the other party admits in in judicio, then then it's effectively the the agreement is now sur survives the statute of frauds prohibition. So so I get, and, and and I may I may just just be me the way I'm looking at it. But for that, I would say, but if a subsequent oral agreement is enforcement of a subsequent oral agreement is being sought, then you can prove in testimony. Or if you were just to strike the words against whom enforcement is such a gr agreement is sought, then you say, however, that if a party admits that the agreement was made or altered in a pleading. Courts may, courts may interpret this right the first time, but if I was a defense lawyer on, if I was, I'm sorry, if I was prosecuting, if I was suing on behalf of a lender, I would try to try to brief that in such a way that someone on the defense side doesn't have an opportunity to do that. I, th I think you're, you're, you're saying that you want clarity on which agreement you're referring to when you we say such agreement on line 28. Yes, Senator, and so I, I, I do like this policy. In fact, I've handled these kind of cases, mostly for debtors, some for lenders, and um, I just know how hard it feels to be a debtor trying to argue these things, you, but I like the policy. Well, you could say, however, if the party against whom enforce, enforcement of the agreement of this subsection B, but, uh, or something like that. That's what such agreement refer, Yeah, what, that's what that's, such agreement is referring yeah. to. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. Such agreement is this, is is this, this subsequent. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, Senator. I think that would clarify it. I think he wants to make so, so when you're when you're looking at it, if you're just looking at line 25, I think y'all were talking past it. So it says any agreement. So we're gonna ignore everything else in A and A because if you look at A, it says promise agreements, contracts and balances. There's all sorts of different types. So B is only contemplating any agreement. Well, what types? The modifying, altering, canceling. Right. And then it refers back to that same agreement by saying such agreement on line 28 and then it says such agreement again, excuse me, it says the agreement on line 28 and then such agreement on 29. So it makes it a closed loop that you know it's only of the type as for modification, altering, canceling, repealing, or revoking. And so what kind of oral statement it has to be, it can't be a self-serving statement. I can't say, oh, I canceled the agreement and that's why it needs to be against whom enforcement is sought because what person wouldn't say, oh no, I canceled it orally and then they get to use it. Because if it's also not against whom it's sought, the other person, they're not going to be in disagreement that it wasn't get canceled. I guess the thing that kind of held me up a little bit was the semicolon in front of provided. Um, I, I would just offer that if, if after the words of such agreement, if the, wor if the addition of, of the subsection, it, it, it might save a little bit of... It might help the courts get it right, but that's just my two cents. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
several people that want to, to weigh in. And I'd rather people weigh in on this issue we're on now before we move to others, because I certainly want to let you talk. Anybody want to talk about this issue? Mr. Wilson does not. What about the sales tax? No. Mr. Walensky, no. Mr. Jones, do you want to talk about this subject or this one? All right. Well, y'all are done on this one, right? <laughs> <laughs> That if the party against whom enforcement of such agreement under this subsection? Yes, yes, Chairman, that's right. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Yeah, if it helps the bill. I think it, it I'm fine with that. I mean, I'm, I agree with Mr. Reed, but we can. We, we can add it in there. It's a two to two vote now. The Senator yep. and Mr. Reed are on the same side. <laughs> That's right. We'll see how the rest of y'all weigh in. I just wanted to know where, where do you like, which one do you like now? I like uh, the way in on this side. Okay. Because it's, it's clearer. You know, it's Turn your mic on down. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just clearer. Fresh, fresh your uh, number five. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's mm -hmm. Go ahead, Pam. Okay. Ms. Stevens. Yeah, I agree with the change so it'll make it specific as to what we're talking about so the change in that would keep it to me um, right okay. and under the UCC okay. thank you Ms. Stevens thank you All right, anybody else on that issue I think we have agreed upon what a change would be if we didn't make it All right. Mr. Jones you want to weigh in on this? Mr. Chairman how you doing Good. How you? Uh, tried looking this up in the section I couldn't find it when it says required in writing, is it fair to assume that somewhere in the code section we refer to things like electronic signature, like DocuSign, et cetera, to be acceptable? You know, I don't know. I think the code section just says writing. Right. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think that may qualify as a writing. You know, maybe a text message that, do you agree to keep release me from this guarantee? and the banker sends a text message back and says, yes, I do. Okay. That, that could qualify as a writing. Okay. All right. Thank you. So. Okay. Mr. Uh, Walensky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hello, Mr. Chairman. In terms of my understanding of this is the idea that the person was under oath or in a court proceeding when they said this information. Yes. And on line 29, you know, we have in a pleading, which is understandable because that's filed with right. the court. But then in testimony, um, is the idea that that testimony is either in a deposit, is under oath, a sworn testimony? Because yes. do we want to clarify that, that it's in, well, I think because it, it could be a des deposition which is under oath, but do we want to make sure the testimony is yeah under oath or a sworn testimony? Well, I mean, I. What kind of testimony is not under oath? Well, just conversation. I, it's I mean, not testimony. Every. How is testimony defined then? Because I mean, everywhere I've seen it in Under the Georgia oath. Code, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there you go. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. All right, Mr. Wilson. Good afternoon, Senator. Over here. Right here. Sorry. Right, right here. Sorry. Right here. Okay. Good to see you. Sorry. Um, I I have a clarity question as well. I think okay. I think this is this is fine, and and um, I sh I share your your intent here. Um. On line 29, the, the phrase, in a pleading, in testimony, or, or otherwise in court, right. what is that modifying? Is it modifying the agreement? The agreement was made in a pleading, in testimony, or otherwise in court? Or is it that it was admitted in a pleading, in testimony, or otherwise in court, that the agreement was made? I think, is, I think there's a dangling modifier here is what I'm getting at. And, mm -hmm. and I think that this would read... If your intent is what I think it is, right. then I think it would read cleaner if it were amended, um, starting on line 28, the party against whom enforcement of such agreement is sought admits in a pleading and testimony or otherwise in court that the agreement was made, then such agreement is enforceable if valid in all other respects. I think that would, that would be great. That would be, I don't have any obj objection to that. 
we just need to go in and, and clean up the UCC, the language of the UCC code, because that's where we looked at <laughs> this from. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. That's it. Okay. All right. There were some other folks who wanted to speak that have changed their mind, evidently. Okay. You got it, Ms. Hillcox? Okay. All right. I know that we have some other people who want to testify on this. Any further questions at this time for the author of the bill before we bring some other folks up? Mr. Chairman, why don't you just slide over a little bit because we might want to chat with you some more. I'll tell you right before I call um, these witnesses up, we do have uh, one of our Superior Court judges, I believe, with us today, um, Kathy Goslin. Where's, 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 there you are. Oh, there you are, Judge, over there. Uh, Judge Weaver's here, too. Okay. Judge Weaver was here earlier this week. She didn't get enough. So, double teaming. Sometimes it requires a lot of supervision down here. So we appreciate both of you being with us, Dan. Thank, thank you for being here. Okay, on this bill, we do have some folks signed up. And let's see here. Brandy Bickle with the um, Georgia Credit Unions. Please come up, Brandy. Good to see you again. Good Happy to have you. you. Thank you. Love to hear from you on Senate Bill 37. Thank you, committee. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for hearing this particular legislation. And go ahead and tell everybody again who, um, who you're with. Brandy Bickle, Georgia Credit Union Affiliates, and we rise in favor of this particular piece of legislation. We view it as very positive, not just from the financial institution perspective, but from the consumer perspective as well, because it creates some bright, clear lines. That way there's no misunderstandings, there's clarity, and it prevents some very costly um, confusion with that so we appreciate your time on this issue thank okay, you. any questions um uh, mr jones you have one mm -hmm. yes sir thank you so much for coming and no, sorry no. that i'm perseverating on this issue <laughs> no uh, but i'm a tech guy so is it fair to say that the credit unions would apply some type of you know electronic app to be able to get the consumer to be able to quickly be able to give quote his or her writing well from our credit union perspective there's a wide range of credit unions that are have a very different um ways of touching their members, if you will. But for those that are very, very tech savvy and they are using the types of loans that this is talking about, which is guarantees, which is not a lot of them, but there are some that do. Um, my understanding is is they try to look at any way possible to facilitate positive interactions with their members. I could not attest or swear to how they're, they're doing this right today. Um, but if there was that Is there a possible blood oath? <laughs> well, it depends on your membership of your credit union. Okay, thank you. So, <laughs> but no, we view it as positive, and it's my understanding, I believe, the, the electronic signature is the same as um, written as well. So I hope. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Right. Thank you. you want to talk to him? I'll talk to him. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Wilson? Mr. Bickle, we appreciate you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for coming today. All righty. Elizabeth Chandler. Elizabeth, come on up. Good to see you today. Thank you. Remind us who you're with, and we'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'm Elizabeth Chandler. I'm with the Georgia Bankers Association, and we have the good fortune to represent most every bank in the state of all sizes, and um, this is an issue that certainly uh, rose to the top of our list when we learned of the Court of Appeals decision. And we appreciate Senator Ligon bringing this bill to uh, correct the situation at hand and and give the certainty that we find so important when extending credit. And we feel like this buttons up this issue. And we appreciate the support and, and time of the committee. Any questions of Ms. Chandler from the committee? We appreciate you being here Thank today. you. Thank you so much. Okay. All righty. I do not have anyone else signed up to speak on this bill. Um, so we will um, bring it uh, back to the committee. Um, Ch Senator, anything else you want to add before we, no, we start discussing amongst ourselves? We'll certainly come back to you if we have any questions. All right. We have before us Senate Bill 37. Is there a motion? There's a motion to pass and a second. Discussion. I think we had talked about some slight changes here who wants to go first May I, mr. mr. dryer absolutely I would uh, move to amend line 28 to add <laughs> after the word agreement the words under this subsection 
under this subsection. There's actually a, the agreement that's twice in that line. It would be the first use of the word agreement. That's on line 28. 28. Okay, you, I see it's right in the middle of the sentence there, under this subsection. Mr. Jordan, do you have that? I do. Mr. Reed, rather? No, not. Okay. Because you're acting as alleged counsel today, right? Sure. Okay. All right. There is a motion and a second on that amendment. Is there discussion? Is there any objection? Hearing none, it's in. Okay. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Chairman, I move to amend uh, lines 28 and 29 by moving the phrase on 29 in a pleading, in testimony, or otherwise in court up to line 28 after the word admits. So tell me those words on line 29 you're going to move again. You you want to you want to strike them and move them or you want to just copy them? Strike them and move them. So we're taking give me the words we're taking out of line 29 again. In a pleading, in testimony or otherwise in court. And you're moving those before or after the word admits. After the word admits. So it would read the party against whom enforcement of such agreement under this subsection is sought admits in a pleading in testimony or otherwise in court that the agreement was made comma then such agreement is enforceable if valid in all other respects senator you got that okay okay there's a motion and a second discussion <coughs> mr reed you have that okay if there is no discussion uh is there any objection it's in Okay. Any other discussion or amendments regarding what is now Committee Substitute Senate Bill 37? Hearing none, we'll go to the final question then. All those in favor of Senate Bill 37 uh, as a Committee Substitute with the Corsair Amendments, uh, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Senator, you're off to rules. Good luck. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Go sit on some committees and pass some house bills now, okay? <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. Oh, who, who's carrying it for you, Senator? Miss Rich. Miss Rich, okay? Thank you so much. All right, we got that. All righty. Is um, Senator Jones in the room? Senator, come on up. Good, and, and I, I, I meant to announce earlier there was a subcommittee meeting just before uh, uh, Senator, uh, Representative Chairman Welch's subcommittee met and approved a version of H.R. 228, um, and we will hear that. Um, the chair is going to add that to the agenda uh, at the after we do Senator Jones's bill. This is uh, Representative Glanton's bill, or uh, resolution, rather. Okay, Senator Jones, welcome. Good, good, to, good to see you today. Yes, sir. How's everything in Augusta? Everything's good. Thank you. Yeah. When's the last time you were there? I was there over the weekend. When's the last time you were there? I was there over the weekend too. Very good so, deal. Great place right, to be. Between the two of us, we keep it straight. There you go. Uh, Senator, good to have you. And uh, please tell us about uh, Senate Bill 29. Okay, on Senate Bill 29, we all heard the adage that you cannot sue the state, but there are certain times where the General Assembly actually allows you to do that. And one of those times where we actually allow for immunity to be waived, specifically waived, is where you have a car accident and where a person is performing their duties. And those duties can be either pursuant to a local government official, such as a person working for a county, or those duties could be pursuant to, such as working for a local sheriff's office. Um, in doing that, we also state specifically and that we define those particular entities in OCGA 39.2.1 and 39.2.3. And what we state is that, yes, you can, we waive immunity and lawsuits can be brought. But what we don't want to have happen, if those persons are performing their duties in the line of duty, what we don't want is that those persons are sued personally. And we specifically exempt um, those local government officials from having that suit. But one of the things we do not specifically state is we do not specifically state that a sheriff deputy is considered to be a local government official into that particular metric. So 
We have done that through case law and the cases in your uh, specifically mentioned in, in your bill, Senate Bill 29. And in that particular case, um, it was a sheriff's deputy performing his duties, was involved in a, an accident, and the sheriff was sued, which is the, the local government entity, which of course is fine, but also the deputy himself was sued individually. And the court did dismiss the particular um, deputy from that particular suit. Um, but it was noted that we do not actually define a sheriff deputy in our exception of who can be sued in OCGA 39.1 and 39.3. Where so a local government entity actor, so tax commissioner for instance, we know that that person is considered to be a local government entity. They could not be sued particularly specifically. So what this bill does is actually define and say that a deputy sheriff um, would be an employee of a local government entity um, and they, we add that language. So a sheriff, an officer, agent, servant, attorney, or employee of a local government entity, or a sheriff, deputy sheriff, or other agent, servant, or employee of a sheriff's office. And that's what it does. It, it codifies that to make sure that an individual deputy individually would not be sued in a car accident particular case. Um, this came up because it comes up constantly in one of my practices where I represent the sheriff's office of Richmond County and the deputies are consistently sued and through case law we're able to normally get them released but it would be better if it was codified and you say well wait a minute if case law does that why 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 we necessarily have to codify this well the supreme court has said on many occasions and, and you guys are aware of this that the general assembly means what it says and says what it means and we are not so far have said specifically that they qualify underneath this exception and I would divert your attention to the case of Harrison versus McAfee, 338 Georgia at 393, where the Georgia Supreme Court overruled um, years of precedent dealing with tolling of statute of limitations. In that case, the Georgia Supreme Court overruled years of precedent dealing with statute of limitations. And the situation is this. When, you have, when you're a victim involved in a crime, the statute of limitations is tolled until the criminal case ends. The way we have been looking at that in Georgia over the years was that that meant that the victim could sue the defendant, the person who harmed them, that it would be told until the criminal case ended. That has been consistently how we dealt with tolling of statute of limitations. It was always done by case law. In the case of Harrison versus McAfee though, the Supreme Court said, well the General Assembly has not said that that's the only way to toll the statute of limitations. They just say in any criminal case, the statute of limitations is told. So in this particular case, the victim was shot at a bar. He didn't sue the defendant, he sued the bar owner. And the bar owner said, well, the statute of limitations is run and certainly the tolling of statute of limitations doesn't apply to my establishment. I didn't shoot you, I didn't have anything to do with it. The, the Georgia Supreme Court overruling about four cases said yes, we have precedent saying that it only applies to the defendant, but that's not what the legislature has told us. And until they tell us different, it applies to any criminal case. And so therefore the statute of limitations is able to be told. So what this does is basically just codify something that yes, it's, it's been said in case law, but it actually doesn't even have the same history that Harrison does. This is really the 2018 case is one of the first cases. So it codifies this to just give that extra protection to our sheriff's deputies. And I have spoken with um, um, Terry, Terry Norris and, and they were on board with this and, and we're continuing to try to go forward. Okay, thank you, Senator. Questions of Senator Jones regarding the legislation? Okay, no one? You must have done a good job explaining. I hope so. <laughs> this crowd usually asks questions. All right, do, I don't think we have anybody signed up to speak on the bill, do we? Okay. All right, Senator, we appreciate you being with us today. The committee will now consider the bill. Is there a motion regarding Senate Bill 29? There, there's a motion due pass in a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Congratulations, Senator. You're Thank off you. the rules. Thank you. Uh -huh. And there will be um, Whip uh, Bodie. William Mr. Bodie. Bodie. Yes. All right. Thank you. Good Thank to see you, you today. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Okay, Mr. Glanton, you want to come up? 
the hold on a second. Okay. Representative Glanton, good to see you here today. Um, Thank you, Mr. I will tell you <coughs> that um, the there have been two subcommittee meetings on the resolution that is in front of you, one yesterday, and then changes were made, and then those changes were approved at today's sub, uh, Chairman Welch's subcommittee. So Representative Glanton's uh, H.R. 228, the L.C. number represented that we're working off of, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is L.C. 345572S. Is that That's right? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Good to have you today. Won't you tell us about uh, House Resolution 228? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee uh, for having me here today. Uh, this is an urgent resolution that's based on the, and I apologize for my voice, I kind of got a cold going here. We, we allow you to be affected by pollen. All right, cold, <laughs> thank so you. Go ahead. So Adopt the Citizenship Act of uh, 2000, and, and basically uh, what, this, what this resolution is urging Congress to do, in the 114th and 115th Congress, uh, they introduced legislation that would uh, call for uh, citizenship, automatic citizenship, for adopted children of U.S. citizens, as they did with those that were 18 and below uh, in age in 2000. What they did was, is in 2000, they enacted legislation that would uh, afford children that were legally adopted by U.S. citizens to be automatic citizen for citizenship. But what they failed to do is those that were 18 and above, they failed to uh, include them in that legislation. So what this resolution urges them to do is those that were 18 and above at the time that the act was enacted, uh, but they were adopted as children under the age of 17, this would now bring a consistency uh, with those that, regardless of age, 18 and older, regardless of age, bring it back to consistency of what they did in 2000 with the Child Adoptee Act. And so basically, uh, the individual was adopted by a U.S. citizen before the individual reached age 18. The individual was physically present in the United States in the citizen parent's legal custody pursuant to a lawful omission before the individual reached age 18. The individual never acquired U.S. citizenship before the enactment of the bill, and the individual was lawfully residing in the United States on the date of the enactment of the bill. And so this involves um, folks from probably 12 to 15 different countries that are here in the United States that do not have citizenship um, based on, and for whatever reason, their parents didn't go through that process. And so we're trying to correct or encouraging cur Congress to correct that. And so uh, is there any, any questions uh, on the resolution itself, Mr. Chairman, that you'd like for me to cover? Thank you, Representative. We appreciate that. Uh, is there any questions of Representative Glanton? regarding uh, H.R. 228. Any questions? And I don't think we have anybody signed up to testify, and, and this one was added to the agenda. Is anybody here that wanted to testify? I don't see any indications. Okay. All right. Thank you, Representative Glanton, and we'll now consider H.R. 228, uh, the L.C. that I just gave you, 345572S. Is there a motion? There's a, there's a motion to pass and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Representative Glanton, you're off to rules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Thank you so and much. And we won't have to ask you who's going to carry this on the floor for you. <coughs> no. <laughs> it depends on how your, vo you depend on how your voice is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate thank it. You so much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, we, um, unless there's any further business to come before committee, we will stand adjourned. Thank you for being here today.